So this is kind of a, a, a wide-ranging topic to say, what are we looking for from a referee? I think looking around, a lot of the group were down with me earlier. Good few. So it might be a little bit of repetition because my philosophy only goes so far. <laughs> if I give myself too many, too many bits, too many dangly bits, I won't, I won't know where to tether myself onto. So, we, looking at what I'm doing with the the group of of high end um, elite performance referees, these are involved in elite performance. Always one of those kind of not a um, bit jarring term, elite performance. But what we're talking about is those in the professional game, whether that's from super six up sevens or anything along those lines. Um, my number one criteria, but it's not my number one because there's so many sub caveats to this, is critical thinkers. Um, and what critical thinkers are is people who pull things apart and say why. A certain generation here will remember uh, the movie Big with Tom Hanks. And he's in the he's in the um, the R and D room, the board meeting room, and they're saying, well it's a it's a building that turns into a robot. And he was like, well what's fun about that? Why does why does a building turn because it does, it's a transformer. Yeah, but why? Because it's a toy. Yeah, but why do it that way? You know? So it's one of those, we want people who can think about the game and their performance and their decision making and say why. The more and more you get into the high end rugby, and really it, the same applies to under eights as well. It's not about right and wrong. It's not one decision available. And those were did the tackle breakdown stuff earlier. We'll see what I mean by it wasn't just about here's one way of doing things. This, here's something to focus on. Move the tackler and everything's OK, which is traditionally the way of doing things. In rugby, we'll have clips sent in saying, well, what's the answer here? And my answer is, I have no idea. You know, what answer do you think it should be? And a lot of it goes to the rules of engagement for the game you're refereeing in front of you, what the players expected, what the watcher is expected. And if you get those things, those melting pots right more often than not, you will be more successful more often than not. Game understanding, again, very hard to quantify. But the better game understanding you have, and if you're a critical thinker, those two meld together really nice. And you become uh, a disruptor and a really difficult person to deal with a lot of the time. But it's what you need to be at the very top end. Processing ability is you can understand the game, you can be a critical thinker, but if you can't look at a complex picture and really quickly diagnose it, you're in trouble. One of the analogies I use is um, what kind of referee do you want is a bit like what kind of surgeon do you want. So let's say something really simple, like you're having your, not simple, but non-life threatening, you're having your ACL reconstructed, or you're having your ankle put back together, or your hip replaced, or whatever it may be. And you go in and you, you, you have your option. You have, you have four or five doctors you could choose from in an ideal world. And you know doctor, doctor one is, is really a really uh, fastidious doctor, does things absolutely perfectly. Doctor five is um, like your man out of ER, uh, George Clooney out of ER. He's good looking, he's great crack. He, does well with all the women, he goes out for a drink on Friday nights, he's brilliant to be around. Which of the scale would you want? Would you want the fastidious doctor or would you want the guy who's great crack? In reality, you probably want the fastidious doctor who can make his team of nurses, anaesthetists, cleaners, everything up and down around them if they can make them as happy and make that environment as good as possible, that's probably your optimum doctor, isn't it? Rather than your person who's just solely focused on doing the one thing. You need that technical competency before you need the, the joie de vivre. So that's a big area that we're looking for. OK, fitness is a really interesting one. Because fitness and rugby refereeing is, is twofold. And the next line down is a really it's a really important, unimportant bit of it. So fitness is important, but to be fit to referee a game of rugby, if, if someone was asked to go out and referee uh, Glasgow Edinburgh on the main pitch there, they could get through the game, couldn't they? A lot of people could get through the game. They might be slightly out of breath, they might be slightly struggling, but people could get to the end of the game. 
But can you do that 40 times in a row? And can you do all the training you need to do in the week on top of that? And can you do that for 12 years without getting injured? So the fitness requirement is huge. Now, the way refereeing has gone, it's all about they almost have to look like suitable players now, don't they? Slightly uh, orientated wingers or scrum halves. A lot of the, the referees now have these haircuts, these high and tights, and they've got the white boots on and everything in between. There's certainly been a, a, a shift from the Clive... Well, maybe it's the same thing as Clive Norling. Anyone's old enough to remember him with the very high shorts and the permy hair. Alan Lewis from Ireland, the, the, the cricketer with the, the silver fox hair and, you know, the, the, the permatan. There's certainly been a movement away to um, uh, aesthetically pleasing people on the pitch, male, female, in between, it doesn't really matter. But that's, it's sort of a question mark. Can you really put that down to say, okay, you've hit all the, you've hit all the bits, no, you look like the back of a bus, out you go. <laughs> Not really sure that that's something you can put down, but what, a lot of what I do is to prepare people or work with people who are controlled at a different, uh, their selection and their success comes from a different area. They're not directly controlled by the SRU. So they, if you get to the top of Scottish refereeing, you go into uh, Super 6, which we can control, great, but then you might go into 7s, that's nothing to do with us, that's someone else saying you're successful or not, into the URC, into EPCR, into uh, World Rugby or any other an acronym that you can think of. It's not just to do with us. So these, these list of, of, um, of criteria are quite hard. Linguistic ability is, I kind of brought, made it up, it's kind of an overly fancy term. What I mean by linguistic ability is on the pitch, can you see something, process it, get the correct words out and move on? in a second, under a second, second and a half. So when you see referees often on the pitch, and you see it sometimes, the best example is anyone watched the games over the weekend, whether it's Wayne Barnes or Luke Pierce in their, uh, their pigeon French sort of delivery, and they're talking to the English speaking team, whether it's Leinster or whatever it was, but they're speaking to them in French because they've got turned around about what they're doing, and they're saying blue lache, yeah. and it's someone from County Kildare on the ball. <laughs> but their brain processing, splitting between speaking in English and speaking in French, delivering the information, or delivering preventative information as or before it's happening at a very dynamic breakdown is really tough. So anybody who can do that while on telly and not sounding like you're from a low, a low, good morning, and I shall only say this once, I think that's a huge, huge skill that you can develop, you can get better at it, of course you can, but if you have the natural ability to do that, to see it and say it and move on, well, that's a, that's a huge advantage to you. Repeatability of efforts. I was talking to a guy the other day who's struggling a bit at the moment, and it's the repeatability of efforts that's pushing him down, that's putting weight on his shoulders. And it's to do with the repeatability of effort on the pitch, the repeatability of effort in decision making, the review, the talking to the reviewer, the talking to his coach, the talking to his boss, the travel, the being on his own, the being in a hotel, doing the game, coach is giving out to you, and on and on and on and on, and just goes and goes, and the more successful he becomes, the more it's happening to him, the more the repeatability of effort is coming. And I talk a lot from a guy, Craig White, I learned from, about the idea of you have your, your brain, which processes and gives you your thought and all that, your heart, which you can feel out there, and it's what you put in, and it's not the effort, but also your stomach, and whether that's your nerves, your self-doubt, or a million different things. We have three different systems talking to you all the time. And can you process that? Can you deal with them? Can you link them? Can you join them to be the best performer you can be? Can you get rid of that self-doubt on the pitch? What do you do if it's your one chance and your one game? And it's not you thinking it's your one game. It's someone coming up to you and going, this is your big chance, by the way. Good luck with that. <laughs> yes. 
You know, what do you do if you're one chance at 50 nil and you walk around and you could wear a hula skirt and everything's fantastic? Or what if it's five nil? I remember like, uh, yeah, give you a story from my own side of things. I was uh, struggling on the world panel. Um, someone didn't want to select me. They got removed, someone came in and they didn't want to select me. <laughs> I said, I'm gonna give you a game. And he was a French guy and he says, Going to give you uh, two tests in the autumn. They're both in France. One the French Barbarians, one France. And um, I'm going to get you to the World Cup, and everything's going to be great. And I was like, oh, that's brilliant. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Someone then got hurt, and he says, JP, I need one more game out of you. The other games are no longer going to count. You're going to have to go do Ireland in Ireland in a November international. It's OK. It's against Georgia. But are you willing to go referee Ireland in Ireland as a trial game to go to the World Cup. I went, well, since you put it like that, there's no pressure at all. <laughs> so I went and did the game. And it was, uh, half time came, Ireland, Georgia, and it was 9-3 to Georgia at half time. <laughs> <laughs> so got out my diary, crossed off, September, October, went, I'm free that month, I didn't want to go for a beer. But it was that idea of, is this game and I haven't done anything wrong, but the fact is 9-3, and even all you reacted, well, you're not going to go to the World Cup if that's the score. If it was 59-3 at half time, you would have gone, well, you're going to the World Cup. And it's putting those, and I remember only that I was able to laugh about it at half time and giggle about, I very much have gallows humor, and giggle about the situation that kind of allowed me to kick on in the second half and do what need to be, and make sure that Gordon, Gordon Darcy is a guy I grew up playing with. I played with Gordon for about 10 or 12 years. And two minutes into the second half, Gordon was captain for the day. And he, was he going to the World Cup or was he, his career finished? He was 36 at the time. And he got the ball on the outside. And I ran beside him. And I'm like, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to run over the line with Gordon, my childhood friend. I'm going to get a picture. Mom's in the background. It's going to be fantastic. And as I run, Gordon was just stuck with a fridge on his back and four Georgians came and smashed him. <laughs> and I was like, well, one of us is going to the World Cup, Gordon, and it doesn't look like you anymore. <laughs> so we all have those moments. And I remember talking to him afterwards. I was like, what happened there? And he goes, well, I just lost my World Cup spot. And he knew it as, he knew it as much as anything. It was just, it had gone one game too far. Gary Neville talks about hauling himself off at half time at West Brom when he just found out someone ran past him and he was like, I can't do this anymore. And he retired the next week. It's famous Gary Neville, if you ever watch those Sky, um, Sky Sports shorts. So there's a lot that goes into elite performances, a million layers behind each one of these things as well. It's just an overview. OK. Uh, critical thinkers. OK. I, have, I could have written up 200 slides on this. But nobody wants that, not even me. OK? You think refereeing is the opposite of that top line, don't we? <laughs> the whole point is to get stuff right, isn't it? But if everything has shades of gray in it, refereeing, unless it's blowing for offside, there's very few bits that are absolutely right or absolutely wrong, isn't it? So you'll give a rolling away, you give a hands off, you give prop this prop, that prop, there's very few definites. Objectively right or subjectively right. Subjectively is what we go. So then it becomes about what to blow and then when to blow it. So that's really tricky, isn't it? How can you coach someone totally subjectively? How can I go to people, this is what I want you to do, but it's subjective. What if the next guy, you're in charge of some acronym somewhere, what are you wearing? We got WRSSSF4, we got EPC or WRC, and all these people, pieces of the pie, all have their view of the game. And I'm not linked with all these people, and yet I'm trying to put you in a position what to blow, when to blow. <coughs> OK? But what to blow, when to blow is most relevant when you're tied to the game that's in front of you. How many of you watch games on telly and you see referees, whether you're involved in refereeing or not, and you know that referee has blown that whistle to tick a box off the pitch somewhere that someone has told them the new thing is diving on the ball coming out of the rug. You, you see it, I think, coming out on Planet Rugby or you know, whatever websites you're on, and say, oh, the World Rugby have said, we're focusing on X. You watch the first game on Friday night, 
Bang, yeah, you see X. The best story I have is EPCR. I came through with a guy called Greg Garner, English referee, went on to become head of EPCR. He came through and I had uh, had some misbehaviors and I wasn't quite refereeing uh, Heineken Cup at the time, but I'd got my game on the Sunday. Greg, who had passed me out for good behaviors, was refereeing the first game of the Heineken Cup that week, Leinster at home to cast. And they said, we're going to fix the, the not straights. Sick of this not straights. We all buy into this. Everyone here has to buy in. The ball has to be put in straight. First time's a free kick. Second time's a penalty. Third time's a penalty and a warning. And the fourth time is a yellow card. We all buy in. If you don't do it, lads, you're dropped. You're going to have to do it. Absolutely have to do it. So like, all right, OK. My game is Sunday in France. 9.30 p.m. Toulouse, whatever, you know, back of France, Bordeaux, whatever it was, Sunday night. Greg's game is 12.30 Saturday in the RDS. First scrum, Julian Thomas from Cass puts the ball in, completely struck, crooked, free kick. Second scrum, puts it in, penalty, Julian Thomas, qu'est-ce que c'est, qu'est-ce que c'est, what's going on, okay? Puts the ball in, crooked again, penalty. Next scrum, puts the ball in, Thing. Penalty warning. La prochaine fois, c'est au carton jaune. Next time, it's a yellow card against you. Puts it in. <laughs> Doesn't quite hook it. Yellow card. Julian Thomas walking off, going, what the fuck? <laughs> Dan, like, what's, what's going on? So off he goes. Greg gets a, a, a note three o'clock from the referee manager. Well, I didn't mean do it like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in my game, I was letting them roll the ball all the way back to the number eight. <laughs> So when you're trying to do these tick boxes, more often than not, the people who want you to tick the box won't support you. Objective, not subjective. Referee that game in front of you. Next one, I love this term because I can talk about this one for hours on end. If you're saying to a referee, we've all heard this saying is, all referees make mistakes, yes? Yeah. Right? And you go out and you feck the game up. And they go, well, yeah, yeah, but you told me I could make a mistake. Yeah, but not that mistake. <laughs> you know, that's an important mistake. I just want you to make mistakes that don't have any influence on the game. All oh, right, because I'm such a high skill level that I can choose when and where to make my mistakes. And have we all, as, even with young referees, have you all done that? Get out there and make your mistakes. It's grand, don't worry about it. Oh, next time you just not need to make that mistake. Oh, cheers, thanks a lot. Like, we don't make mistakes on, on purpose. There are errors in what we do. Make sense? So I'll, I'll come back to that later on in another slide, but I think it's a really interesting one. If you took nothing away of what are you expecting of the referee, people who are coaches and everything else, and you say, well, we expect the referee to make mistakes. Are you only saying that if they make a mistake against the opposition, <laughs> where it affects them and not your team? Or do you expect big mistakes against your team because they're humanistic? Now, if you referee the game in front of you, the game will be better. And where I say to one of our, one of, in particular, one of our referees, I say, when I started working with him, I said, one of the big difficulties is, from your refereeing, I don't see a reason why your name should be put on the sheet and not a another. You've got to show me a reason why you're doing that game. Not because you can referee the laws and you can get this right or that right or card this guy or TMO this or anything else, you've got to show me why, when we do a selection, it's your name. And people say, oh, X has to do that game. He'd be really good in there. He'll make that game better. Now, sometimes the rules of engagement in that game is 35 penalties. Sometimes it's five penalties. We don't know. But you can look ahead and say, right, oh, God, I know it's a sevens game. It's on Murrayfield. Love sevens, so we're going to put Holly Davison in there. She's top class operator in sevens. She'll make it better. She's UA, UA. That's what the two teams want. Under 18s, it'll fly. Or they say, do you know what? It's going to be two miserable teams playing miserable rugby. We'll put JP Doyle in there. He's a miserable git. He can go out there and do it for them. OK, so, but in selection, you have to get out there and make that game better. That kind of bottom line there is, is an interesting impact as well, choosing optimal outcomes. And what I mean by that is not having one decision each time. 
if you don't have one decision, you're not dug into it to say, well, he was offside or he didn't roll away. If you said, yeah, I would have chosen that, but the reason why I didn't choose this decision is because this one was better for these reasons. And that's a huge amount of processing skill to do on the fly. But the more you try it, the more you'll get better at it. OK? So I'll just let you read that just for a second. So this is a, this is a new approach I'm trying. That's kind of it's in secret, so don't tell anyone. Um, but traditionally, refereeing, anyone who's involved in refereeing knows it's about, you know, write down, oh, you missed this, and you missed that, and this is a non-decision, and this is an error. What we don't do enough of is stacking. So if we look at, well, what's a good decision? When, when did you go well? What part of the game did you help? Did you, did you add value to? If you can multiply those consistently and constantly, and if you know what they are and you try to repeat them, rather than, I didn't know whether to put it down as, uh, maybe I didn't put it in, as, is it tax avoidance or tax evasion? There we go, down the bottom. To avoid or evade mistakes. If you're worried about making mistakes, oh, I better make sure I was pulled up on offsides last time. So I'm just going to make sure anything 50-50, I'm just going to take, I'm not going to take the chance and I'm going to blow a penalty there. That mightn't help the game. But you were told last, your last four games, space was a problem, space was a problem. Rather than, here are the three clips, the five clips of you getting it absolutely right. So here's a line break, you're in great position, you scanned, you saw the guy, you moved him back, we played through, you didn't need a penalty, brilliant referee. So the next time you have a line break, you think, I know what the positive was. Let me stack that. Let me make stack, stack, stack. The more chips you have on the table, the more chance you have of covering all the things that come up. OK? If you think of it, roulette. If you have, if you have lots of chips, you can cover the board much better than having a chip in a chair and you have to choose red or black. Make sense? So if I just show, if I come out of this, and I just show some of the, the ways we're doing this. So if I pick, pick any game there, we can look at any game you want. So let's say uh, card of zebra. So when I do these, these, these clips here, so if we look at the tackle, right? This is Ben Blaine refereeing card of zebra. It's a little bit out of focus there. Can, is anyone? If I touch that, it will break, won't it? <laughs> I, think, I think I'll stay in my lane here a little bit. Um, so these will play through. First so I try and stack positives. URC campaign against the Dragons. So I call this just positives, just two rooks Palmer. in the first two minutes. And last weekend, Cardiff on the other hand. So what was positive about that? Or am I talking kick? absolute nonsense? First win of the URC campaign against the Dragons. Right. At home Correct. Palmer. So you're seeing players moving in the right Last way. Weekend. So you see what we discussed earlier on the other hand. Around, that number, around that number six the is exactly kick. what, for those who were outside with me earlier. First win of the okay. URC campaign. So he's moving, Dragons. he's positive. I call that a connectivity to the game. Palmer. So he's finding the ball, he's seeing the six, Cardiff he's processing it, and his delivery is, I don't need to speak here. Kick. It's not necessary. Delhi, I think he's taken that. Great float intake, but Liam okay. has won the turnover. Another one right on is the holding here. And the reason why he's positive is nothing kick. to do with the decision being right. What is he trying intake, to do? But Liam what was his connection? Got his mitts right on... It was an optimal outcome, right? Let's see if anyone can. It's pretty high end sort of stuff, but if you just watch Ben, great float intake, but there was a hesitancy, wasn't there? Right. So do you see why it goes down as a positive? What was his brain thinking? Yeah. Yeah. Do we have a turnover opportunity? You know. And then he said, No, there's not. He also his feet were moving which means it's a really easy, as I see it, easy processing for him. Because if he's finding it difficult, what do your feet do? They get in cement, don't they? Generally, they get in cement when we're asked to do lots of different things. There's a, there's a learning scale, isn't there, that we go cognitive, associative, autonomous. 
okay? And every time we have to rethink about stuff, it goes back to cognitive, and we're like, oh, how do I do that? How do I juggle? You know, when we drop a ball in juggling, oh, how do I juggle again? We get worse at juggling. Then we get into our flow. Then it becomes autonomous, and we don't have to worry about it. We can just juggle, okay? Good example there. So what we're trying to do with Ben here is we're trying to constantly reinforce the good stuff he's doing. Use it! And they're gonna go for a second nudge, told to use it. Ratty picks Priestland to Cabango into traffic. Cronia with a tackle. Stay on your feet. Right, good, Support well. just about See takes that? here. Lloyd Williams gets He also on that recognized that his command had Lane, that no the player had already touch, either followed nine. it or it was no longer necessary. So he wanted an emotional buy-in from him. for a second nudge, told to use it. Ratty picks Priestland to Cavango into traffic. Cronia with a tackle. Stay on your feet. Right, good, Support well. just about gets it. Right. Did he sound like Wayne Barnes or Ben O'Keefe or anyone else? Just sounded like Ben Blaine there, didn't he? Very humanistic, very part of what we're doing. There's no forcing anything. OK? Also, I'll throw in, look, ND. This is the kind of stuff quickly. that you need to be getting back. Lane, Owen Lane with his first touch, playing nine. He's there again. Do we see why? Number three Lord down. Not a big deal. Ball, Play on. This one. It goes in there. Chip on to a Bonfiglio. He gets it to the deck. That's three, good work. So, so earlier, someone was asking me out in the pitch, at what stage do you stop saying, well done, thanks very much? At what stage do you start pra stop praising people? Never. There's always room for it. The certain look, this is 28 0 after 25 minutes. That's the rules of engagement on that game. This is Leinster La Rochelle, it's 0 0 for 28 minutes. It's a different game, different requirements. Okay? Also, I'll have stuff where He's I don't know there. the answer. Just got to find some go forward of Zebra. That won't help. That will. So I'll just put it up as, as questions. Oh, that's your shot, do Belcher. And you go, oh, well, what do you think about that? There's a lot going on in that breakdown. And what I'm looking for him to do is explain to me why he does it. Give me the reason. So I always say, take me on the journey with you. I don't have to agree with you. You can give a yellow card when I think penalty. That's absolutely fine. My, my opinion's worth less than yours because you're as a practitioner. But bring me with you. Tell me why you want to do it that way. Okay? I'll do stuff like where, you know, every so often where I'm like, mate, easy meat, we got to get Pan that. That's part it. of our vernacular is both of what we're getting. Brave on the ball. So 19 off feet. Yeah, and what I mean by that is no, anyone who's with me earlier, easy Pan meat, after it. rules Pan of engagement. Which team's under pressure? Blue. Blue. What's the score? 35 yeah, Right. What's the time? Is that a clear seal off by 19? Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, but it's clear seal off, isn't it? Easy peasy, easy meat, you got to get this. And what I'm saying by that is I'm kicking him in the arse going, that's below professional standards. Everything we're working for, you should be better here. Now, we'll look at his positioning. Why were his eyes up rather than down? Why was he not thinking? When that ball was loose here, when we talk about critical Three. thinkers... Back. Pat. Yes, but what should you be thinking here? Yes. Yes. You got to be thinking ahead. Okay. Chestnut checkers. Chestnut checkers. Yeah. We don't follow the script. We think ahead. Now the fact he played ahead. Did any of you see it first time? Really? Did half the group miss the 19 off feet? Most people missed it. Once I pointed it out, wasn't it obvious? But if he had just blown one there immediately and you would have waited for the explanation of the penalty, you, you would have gone, you wouldn't have questioned when the whistle went. Correct? I'll show you a really good example of that. It's with Ben again. Yeah, it was a bit just. It was just a bit lazy in mind. Ah, uh, you know, I'm like, no, man, it's a two-hour job. You're paid for two hours. You know, it's like a, a, you know, you take off from from Edinburgh or London Heathrow, and the pilot can't be arsed to land it in in New York. I got you most of the way there. Is that not good enough? No, it's not. 
<laughs> Please land the plane. So this is a good example. Score, time, place. This is the best example of where we got to get this guy at the very, very top end, the next level of thinking. OK? Decision? Right. He gave a holding on. There you go. And he's not wrong. He's not wrong. He, he actually is right and you're all wrong. However, what did I say? Rules of engagement. What do people expect? What do you need to do? So my pimpy gets the ball here. Right, my pimpy down the wing. Look at the score, look at the time, look at the place. The rules of engagement for what you're doing there. Now, what Ben gave was a double roll by the attacking player. He's 100% correct, isn't he? He's 100% wrong, isn't he? <laughs> this is my point. But he was, he was presenting the ball, though. But he rolled over to stop the jacklet. The reason why 20 ended up off his feet is because there's a double roll. That was momentum when he was placing it, and there was no jackler. No. No. No, because he's stopped now, and there's two jacklers. He's facing the Ulster try line, and he decides to turn to face his line. However, you all are rugby people here, yes? Put your hand up if you thought that was a penalty to Ulster before I outlined the rollover. You to, to Ulster. Oh, oh, okay. Against Ulster. No, who thought it was a penalty to Ulster? OK, one person out of, let's say, 40, 50. OK, so you're a two percenter, right? Now that I've pointed out, you all went, oh, I can do this with every single clip there's ever been. I can bamboozle you with signs. You know when Rachel from Friends has her hair Pantene, now comes the science bit, you know, the Pantene ad, and they tell you how the serum works and all that BS. I can do that all day, every day. Rugby people watching this, What's the decision? What was your visceral? What was your visceral stomach bum? What did you think? Yellow card. Penalty yellow card. OK, yeah, fine. That's, that's f yeah. But you, you thought, bum, get rid of him. Bum, get rid of him. I was at home, having the most beautiful glass of Rioja, watching this game. Then I had to throw the kid out the window, kick the dog. <laughs> I had to, oh, I nearly, I never get emotional watching games, but Ben was brilliant for 70 minutes. And then uh, my technical term here is he boo booed. Okay? You know, daddy yucky. That's, you know, as my son would say to me. <laughs> right? The only reason I knew, John Cooney's an old friend of mine. And I know how difficult he is. He's, he's as narcissistic as I am. And when I saw, I was like, why is John happy? I hadn't seen it yet. I was like, John, why are you so happy? Oh, no. Also knew from his body language and his delivery that he knew he was wrong. All right? You can see by just standing there delivering, I knew, nah, I don't believe you, Pinocchio, something's wrong here. OK? It didn't decide the game. The game was over. But the rules of engagement are so important. And those clips really outline that. Does that make sense to everyone? Not about being right and wrong, yeah. Yeah, wait till everyone's screaming and then blow your whistle. Um, <laughs> that's my parenting style. Uh, no, you, you don't you don't, and it's a learning curve. And the best in the world are really, really good at it. And people learning are learners. And that's it. There is no shortcut to it. It's just getting out there, doing it. And as long as the first thing you have to do is you have to, first thing you've got to learn what the tackle is and all that sort of, like those who were with me earlier, you've got to learn the ABCs. We did it. We actually did ABCs, didn't we? Then we learned it was, you know, B, A, C, 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 B, A. And it wasn't ABC. It gets more complicated, right? But you all came on that journey with me, didn't you? And you all understood it, right? The next thing is to go on the pitch and practice it and get it wrong. The next point is, right, I don't always have to implement this 
the same way every time. It can be game related and get that wrong. The next thing is to understand the breakdown a little bit further, a little bit more advanced and put the game understanding. That's the next bit up here and you keep moving and you keep moving back. Oh no, not quite there yet. No, I'm not quite back there. And you'll see it over and over again. And that's why the best referees, whether it's Wayne Barnes or Yako Piper, okay, they make the best decisions because you can understand them the most. They're the most understandable, whether it's Jerome, uh, Jerome Garces or Wayne Barnes or whatever it may be. How do we get the players and coaches to buy into that? Stuff? Well, you have to do it immediately. So you have to pick. That's, that's the elite skill. That's the critical thinkers. That's the linguistic challenge. That's the seeing it, making it happen. That's why it's elite thinking. That's why the fitness can play no part in your game. You have to be, look how fit Ben is out there. You, that could be no part of your performance. It's just part of you and the repeatability to do it over and over again. The most sometimes we blow our whistle and go technically correct, and they'll go, I hate that decision. Yeah. So it's about getting these decisions right for the game and then it's just a decision at the end of the day. And that, that the coach will then be a lot happier. So I describe them as jarring decisions. Would jarring make sense to you if you're watching a game? Or I call them teeth suckers. So yeah, exactly. You do the game and you go, oh, 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 yeah, okay, the referee's right, but it's like, oh, there was one yesterday in the European Cup final, La Rochelle penalised on the Leinster five-metre line, having not been penalised as scrum all day long by the AR. And the whole crowd, even the Leinster supporters, went, oh, oh, yay! <laughs> of course that's the decision. Brilliant. Next slide's gonna make that more muddy. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you consistent. Yeah. So this is my very advanced slide. This is about as far as my clip art goes from anyone remembers Word 97 clip art. <laughs> this is sort of as far as I can go with it. So this is this is my everything. This is up in my room, never comes down, it's written on my walls. This is everything. So that should sum up everything. So thanks very much for your time. <laughs> so this is just a house. It's a 400,000 pound house in Edinburgh. So it it's, it hasn't got any walls, nowhere to park. No, so this is what the house is built on, okay? My end of the game isn't to teach people basics, it's not, to teach people how to do it, blow the whistle, safety, speed, scrum, blah, forget it. You, you shouldn't be in the room if that's what we need to do. You need to get yourself here by refereeing, learning, experiencing, going to meetings, talking to people, talking to coaches, talking to players, being involved in rugby your whole life, or coming to a late and learning, doesn't really matter. But this, this foundation, the gravel, the sand, the concrete, what's that mesh called that they put in the concrete? Well, the, re the reinforced steel, the rebar, thank you, perfect. The rebar, see my technical understanding of it. Um, <laughs> but the sand, the gravel, the dirt, everything, the rebar, the concrete gets get poured, like the house gets built on. It's got to be perfect. If you're missing those elements, you can only manipulate things you understand, or you can only manipulate them well if you have a complete understanding of what you're doing. So when it comes to tackle breakdown or it comes to scrum, or it comes to that, I can bullshit with the best of them. You know, talking for an Irish man, talking about rugby, easy peasy. I'll bamboozle you with science, right? This technical understanding has to come. It has no bearing and no value on what your house looks like. Okay, if your house is not built well, it'll have, you'll have a problem. But if it is built well, it has no bearing on the overall picture of what your house looks like at the end. Okay, these three things here. ROE, not going to be hard for people to guess. Guess what it is? Rules of engagement. 
all right? This is meant to be a circular house, but I couldn't get 3D working, okay? So it's, it's three pillars in a circle, okay? People over performance. Can anyone guess? You're not going to be wrong if you guess, so don't worry. I'm not, this is not, I'm not setting you up. No, that's a good answer, but it's not quite right. What do you think that means? People over performance. So putting people over performance. Correct. Yeah. So that could be players, that could be coaches, that could be correct. Putting them before your performance. Okay? Those involved in refereeing, me included, we've all gone out and refereed to get to the next game. If I do this game well, I'll get the World Championship Super Cup at the end here. I'll get the, the final on the day, the next game up, the under 16, whatever it is, whatever the next game we'd like to do. Okay? Doing that, and I've certainly done it a million times over but I've fallen down more often than not by doing that. If you put the people, whether that's the players, the coaches, spectators, the parents, all of that in front of the need for you to have a successful performance, you are far, 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 far stronger. And that's the position I coach from. As you can see on the clips with Ben, the sort of area that we're looking at, you know, how do we deliver, that, how do we deliver stuff that's relevant more than right, okay? The rules of engagement, People with me have covered this 100 times over. I'll never get bored of it. But it's the game on the day, and it changes. It changes with the weather. It changes with a scoreline. Now, many of you have done a first half where there's eight tries. Then they go and talk to their coaches at half time. The second half, no tries. You know, what was the only change? The coach is saying, we've got to start making tackles. We've got to start, you know, playing down there. And we can't let, you know, you both scored four tries. Now you both scored none. The only impact is the coaches changing what you're doing. So the rules of engagement, they can change very quickly. They can change quite literally with the weather. If you have a beautiful dry day and all of a sudden uh, sunny, sunny hail showers come and the ball's like a bar of soap, it becomes very difficult, doesn't it? So the type of game changes. Okay, the scoreline. It might be a Jouet Jouet game and all of a sudden it's the last 10 minutes and it's a three-point game and everything changes and you have to just referee it more. Those who watched the European Cup final yesterday saw Wayne Barnes go from flowery, flowery, flowery all day to the last 20 minutes. It had to be refereed. And the rules of engagement was, Barnesy, no one's interested in hearing from you, just referee the game. Lencer offside penalty, Lencer offside penalty, bin them, whatever it may be. Make sense for anyone who saw that? Yeah. The rules of engagement changed in that game. Okay, adding value. Goes to that saying earlier, why is your name on the sheet and not another person? It doesn't mean elite level or anything else like that. It's just, why do we want you on this game and not someone else? It's because you're there to make it better. Maybe only by the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest margin. Maybe something they'll never notice. But it'll just make it that little bit better for them. So where did Ben add value on some of those breakdowns? By saying nothing. Other breakdowns, thanks, oh, thanks very much. Well done. No, you didn't do anything there. Great. Where do we pull them up on not adding value? didn't read the score time, place, location, 50 meters down the pitch, Matt Pimpy, crowd going mad, wonderful rugby, oh, oh God, we've gone the wrong way. The balloon just, just deflated, didn't it? <laughs> just went, all the air went out. Yeah, subjective, not objective. You can't, in swimming parlance, you can't touch the wall before the next referee. You can't serve an ace past them. You can't shoot 65 while I shoot 72. It's totally subjective. The objective measures are gone. All those other sports, we have objective measures. 15 love, you swam it in one minute 42, you shot 65. In refereeing, it's, uh, it's completely subjective. Yep, I think I like the cut of your jib. And how do we put ourselves in subjectively better spots? By knowing what you want to do and how you want to do it. So we have these three pillars here that are really, really, really important. To me, this is made up. This is from the mind of a lunatic, right? And then on top goes the game. So the game comes after that. So my house looks brilliant. I just got to stick a roof on it, OK? And all the roof is the game, ACH, which I obviously stole. What's that come from? Anything can happen. Anything can happen. 
right? It's not meant to catch you out. But you plan for this game, you plan for, I don't know how many times I lay in bed before a really big game, you know, Twickenham or, you know, I got to referee in some great cathedrals, Eden Park in New Zealand or in, in, uh, in Johannesburg and Ellis Park and thinking, oh, it's going to be an amazing, wonderful day. And I get out of bed the next day, I'm so excited, I open the curtains and it's just pissing down. I'm like, oh, fuck. that was not in the dream, okay? Or you go out after two minutes, England, Ireland. You go out after two minutes, England, Ireland. You can't wait to referee England, Ireland, Twickenham. It's going to be amazing. Six nations. Won't it be fabulous? Two minutes in, red card against England team, the home team. And you're just thinking, oh, my God. You can imagine what Matthew Arnold thought after two minutes. Okay? Anything can happen. So the game preparation is irrelevant because the butterfly effect, so many small things can change everything to do with it. But if you're prepped here, on this, and you know what you want to do, okay, you may fall down, and if you lose one of these, and it's circular, it's coming down, isn't it? The whole thing's falling. If this is really good, it gives you a great point to go from, if this is not really good and this starts subsiding, we're screwed as well, aren't we? So it's a pretty rudimental diagram, but hopefully it makes sense. So when I'm coaching guys or they're out there, they understand what I'm trying to do with them. They understand what they need to do to be successful. Okay. Right, the next thing. This is what I want you to do. I don't want you to read that. I want you to talk to people on your table. What are we doing time-wise here? Okay, we've got five minutes left, have we? I want you just two, three-minute talk, quick pie chart. What would a pie chart look like what would a pie chart look like if you had four sections of a pie chart to make the perfect referee? So you have 100%, the pie chart's 100%, not, it's 360 degrees, but it's 100%. What would the pie chart look like? Would it be 90% JP awesomeness? Would it be 50% technically right? Would it be 50% something else? All right, we'll get, you, we'll, get you, we'll get you home nice and quick. Right, okay, who wants to... Pony up first. Go on, Andy. Come on. I didn't hold my mouth here. Um, we've grouped a couple together, but you know, laws are fundamental, so they've got to be part of Percentage, that, right? yeah, percentage. Uh, 30-ish percent. 30-ish, okay. Of, of the whole so you want someone to be really accurate around law, but only 30-ish percentage. No. <laughs> We're taking it that as All right, okay. it's 30% of the pie yeah, yeah. that they are 100% accurate in them. No, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, 30-ish percent of accuracy. No. <laughs> go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. It makes up 30% it, of I the I understand, I understand. Any yes. idiot can blow a whistle yes. with no I do, yeah. thank you. Okay. Uh, fitness... Yeah. Appropriate to the game. Yeah. Um, your communication skills are a large part of it again, probably over thirty percent. And a, combined together, a confidence and an empathy for the game and the players. Yeah. Four main elements for us. What's your biggest element? The biggest one. Yeah. Uh, confidence and empathy for the game because that'll well, show. Forty, that. forty, fifty percent. Yeah. Forty percent. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> She's accurate. She's accurate. Fitness 15, technical 15, empathy comms about 40, and game management 30. Right, game management 30. Who's got a really big piece of pie? Anyone got a... Cut me a real piece, in the words of Joey. Who's got a, who's got a big piece of pie? It's all my stomach. Yeah, yeah. I know that feeling after that. Brownies. Right, good example. Maybe... So I'm, our first default as maybe officials is to try and classify into laws and this and that. Half of what you do is, yeah, 90. Secret 10%. You're right. It's because I changed it. Let's say law and individual is 15. See, I don't care about accuracy. Follow on for you. It's too easy a target. Yeah. So 50% is just refereeing what's in front of you. Yeah. Just referee the game. Turn up 50% and watch it. Stop taking photos to put it on the internet that I got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this is a camera-free zone for the next four minutes. That's it's already been tweeted. Yeah, it's all right. Um, you need to know your laws as your fundamental base. 
okay? But it's not that important, okay? The individual as well. So refereeing the game in front of you plus the individual. Who, what, who are you? What are you doing? And then there is always, so if you just turned up on the day and got most things wrong, but got the big three things right. Now, that's really difficult to do because it goes back against what I said earlier about <laughs> what we don't choose when we make mistakes. But what we can do is we can be focused, we can have the other things right, and then we can recognize the big moments. So you saw with Ben, that was a big moment, wasn't it? So he didn't have to make a decision. If it was 50-50 there, and he recognizes a big moment, what was the decision it would have been? With the Ulster, the Ulster and the Sharks player. So it's, it's 72 minutes, Sharks running up the pitch, crowd going bananas, 20 points difference in the scoreline. You recognize the big Sharks moment. Thing. Correct. Penalty yellow card, and we know what we're doing. So recognizing the big moments helps you get the big moments right. Does that make sense? Unlike my pie chart, that makes sense. All right? OK, so we won't need to get into this. We'll just have a look at this just for two seconds. But a lot of people talk about, what if you just turned up and refereed the game? Just actually refereed the law. Ping, 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 water polo. I grew up playing water polo. The referee had a whistle in his mouth the whole time. He held a flag in his hand. When you gave away uh, one free, it was a white or a blue. And if you looked at the referee in the eye, you got binned. That was, that was the rules of the game. That was the rules of engagement. That was fine. So you just went bip, 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 and you just got on with the game. It was continuous, it was continuous whistle in water polo, but continuous play. All right? So what if you stuck very closely to the law? What would the game look like? Is that a game we want to play? Is that a game we want to play? OK. So old school refereeing. Old school refereeing, you turn up, you first 20 minutes, you blow eight penalties, roll away, roll away, offside, offside, and then you stick your whistle in your pocket and you say, I've set the game up. Doesn't matter that no one rolled away in the last 25 minutes and everybody was offside in the last 25 minutes. OK. So microscopic consequence. If you referee the little detail, if you're microscopic in your refereeing, what will happen? OK versus the clear and obvious and having good fundamental reasoning to what you're doing. Okay? We won't get into it, but it's just something to, to, to think about. And then the last one is the consumers. If you, if you turned up and refereed for your consumers, now whoever they may be, if you're under 8C team, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's the general a policy. But if the players, coaches, spectators, viewers, whatever it may be, Whoever was at the game, even if it was just parents, if you referee to their expectation level, so you turn up, you do a game, you walk off, and they say, we really enjoyed that referee. We thought they did a great job. Does it matter how you actually refereed? Mm -hmm. Is it relevant at all? If you got the five big decisions wrong, and everyone thought, yep, yeah, that's what we expected today. We're really happy with that referee. Thank you very much. Off you go. Here's a jug. Go to the bar, fill it up, have a nice time. We'll see you inside for a quick chat. Yes, yes. Well, that's, that's what I'm saying. Does, it doesn't matter about being right and wrong. Right and wrong is irrelevant. It's irrelevant. The view, subjective viewpoints is relevant. Let's say you could prove you were right on every single thing that they were pissed off about. They'd still be pissed off. Correct. There's no point being right on an island. There's no point standing in the middle of an island on your own, hook fin, nothing around you, you're on your own. Well, they keep trying to, that's what they keep trying to do. That's, that's their intention, but they're just not very good at doing that. <laughs> like, if, 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 you, if, if you don't, <laughs> it's all political. If, <laughs> if, if there's no rules, we've had that before. What do you have? You have mob, fo mob football. It's, it's what it, no, mob football is what it came from. It's what all these invasion games came from. Moving a ball from one town to another town across lakes and hills and everything else, and everyone in the town, 500 people play, and you still see uh, footage of that in France where they do it, or Ireland, or Gloucester, or Gloucester, Friday, <laughs> Gloucester or Cardiff on a Friday night. They still you, do it with a goat. Yeah, you see with a goat. You see, so mob, mob, mob football is what all this came from. Invasion games all came from the idea. Rugby is an invasion game. You take a ball from one territory into another. The reason why it's called the goal in soccer is because the objective of the game is to put the ball in the net. That's the goal. 
The goal of rugby is to score a try to try and convert the points. That's where, it all, that's where the evolution of it came from. So if you could keep people happy, would it matter if you got everything wrong? And I'll just leave you with that thought, just to change things around. All right? Hope you enjoyed it. Sorry for running on a bit long.